Our next speaker is uh, Freya Dinshaw. Where's my dear Freya? <laughs> okay. I met Freya in 1975 in Arano, Maine, and at that time, her husband and she organized the first International Vegetarian Union Conference in the United States. 1975, is that right? And I, I was truly impressed with both of them, and I still am. And I think she's a wonderful person to carry on with the work with the American Vegan Society. I consider both uh, Freya and her husband as the father and mother of the modern vegetarian vegan movement in the United States. So I truly appreciate all you have done, and Jay also. So here is Freya. I'm so glad you could come. I'm so glad you could come. I haven't seen her for a number of years, so it's really good to have you here. So you can speak right in there. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Well, I'd like to say how delighted I am to be here with you today and for this conference and festival and share with you how important these gatherings are. Uh, the international gatherings, how we get together and inspire each other. And I will reminisce a bit about some of the people who've been at conferences in the past because really there are some giants in our movement and very inspirational people. When I was in school, there was a song that we sang about 40 years on. Well, it's almost 40 years since we planned the 1975 World Vegetarian Congress to be in the United States. And some of the people who were there are here with us in this room today. And some of them, of course, have passed on, but their legacy is with us. We're in California, and so I remember the time that uh, Jay and I lived in California, which was in 1961 and 62. We came to California because of its reputation for New Age thought, a healthful living, and a place where you would find other vegetarians. Very hard to find in New Jersey, but we came to California looking for other vegetarians. And some of the wonderful things that we found in California, things that seemed magical, growing on the trees were oranges, avocados, and all the organic vegetables. Some of you may remember Dr. Edmund Zeckerley, who had a health spa in Rancho La Puerta in Tecate, Mexico. He had uh, quite a sphere of influence. I know that uh, my parents back in the 1940s uh, were influenced by people who followed Zekele's teachings and had a vegetarian society in Leatherhead in England. In California in the 60s, there was the Self-Realization Fellowship, Paramhamsa Yogananda. And very important in Loma Linda, California, the Loma Linda University and the Seventh-day Adventists, who were really the backbone and uh, the roots of vegetarianism in this country. Uh, their leader back in the 19th century had taught vegetarianism for health reasons and being a church um, that advocates its principles, the Adventists had traveled widely in the world, including going to China, and so it was in China that um, they learned about soybeans, making soy milk, and brought that back to the United States. Indeed, the first health food stores, well, I hesitate to say first, because things are never the first, there's always something before, but um, the health food stores in the 40s and 50s were largely run by Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, they had the um, soy milks made by Loma Linda and Worthington and meat substitutes and other things to help people follow a vegetarian and even a vegan diet. 
In California, when we were there, in Los Angeles, was a remarkable fellow, an Italian, Dr. Pietro Rotondi. Do any of you remember him? He held dinners in his house, which, was, which were attended by a colorful bunch of people, including uh, Dr. Bronner, who formulated the Bronner's soap, which I think you must know about, Bronner's liquid peppermint soap. Dr. Rotandi had written a vegetarian cookbook, Vegetarian Cookery, and this was in the mid-1940s. And except for the use of honey, it was a vegan cookbook. California was a stronghold of the Theosophical Society, and many vegetarians came out of the Theosophical movement, including um, Helen Neering, whom we'll talk about a little later. While we were in California in about 1962, I think it was, the American Natural Hygiene Society held a convention in, in San Diego, and Dr. Herbert Shelton was one of the speakers. Uh, he was a real power in the health movement and um, brought together health teachings um, going back into the previous centuries and, and gave them and presented them to the to people in the US. Some of the speak speakers in those days were great speakers. They didn't have microphones and they, they could really project their voice uh, across the hall and Herbert Shelton was one of those people. It's not just um, his voice but his message was very strong and motivating people to live a healthy life. Of the natural hygienists in the hills of Escondido was Dr. Gerald Benish, who had an establishment where he gave people the opportunity to fast and eat natural foods. Someone else you might have seen in California back in the early 60s was Peace Pilgrim who was a woman who had um, taken a vow of poverty, wore only the clothes that um, she had on her back, a, a tunic, um, pants, some sneakers. She had pockets around her tunic in which she covered all her worldly possessions, a comb, ladder writing um, materials. And she had vowed and did walk more than 25,000 miles for world peace. Uh, she was a vegetarian, and she taught people about peace in themselves, that we should have it in our hearts for each other, the people in our family and our acquaintances, as well as to be thinking about world peace. But it starts in ourselves. There was a movie, I don't know if anyone, any of you have seen it, probably um, produced in the, in the 1950s. It was called Athena. And it was a light-hearted and romantic spoof of the vegetarian scene in Southern California. It starred um, Ed Port Eddie Porton and Vic Damone as uh, young men caught pursuing sisters um, Jane Powell and Debbie Reynolds whose family ran a health food store. But, so far as the guys were concerned, there was no dice with the girls unless they changed their way of living and eating. Also in California, we met Dr. Catherine Nimmo and Ruben Abramowitz. Catherine Nim Nimmo was probably in her 80s by then they had the first vegan society in the United States, and they had set out to establish a community in Oceano, California, which is halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, they have wonderful sand dunes in Oceano. However, starting a community um, is a difficult thing to do. Many are attempted and few succeed. Dr. Nimmo continued living in Oceano and Ruben Abramowitz uh, went back to um, work in Los Angeles. 
but uh, they ran the society there until we started the American Vegan Society in 1960, whereupon Catherine Nimmo became our first paid member. In 1965, Jay and I attended the International Vegetarian Union Conference in Swanwick, England. That was also the year of the 21st anniversary of the Vegan Society in England, which has also influenced us greatly, our strong connection with, with Eva Batt. Jay spoke in Swanwick, and as many of you may remember, he was a dynamic speaker, uh, very motivating, uh, so, so that uh, his talks were rather like sermons, impelling people towards vegetarianism and veganism. As a consequence, many of the delegates invited him to speak to their vegetarian societies uh, in different parts of the world, so in 1967, he set off on a round-the-world trip to Iceland, Europe, the Middle East, India, where the next World Congress was held, and round the world to Malaya, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, and back to New Jersey. In 1973, at the World Congress in Ronneby, Sweden, a number of delegates from the United States had been saying, why do, isn't there ever a World Congress in the United States? And they had been told, we need an invitation. So the invitation was issued by members of the Toronto Vegetarian Society and Montreal Society, by Helen and Scott Neering, who had the Social Science Institute in Maine, by Ruben Abramowitz of the Los Angeles Vegetarian Society, and by my husband Jay of the American Vegan Society. Our in invitation was accepted. We had to find a place to hold the Congress, and the place selected was the University of Maine in Orono, which had been recommended by the Nearings, Helen and Scott. The length of that Congress was 12 days. And the organizers were um, Brian Gunking, who was then General Secretary of the International Vegetarian Union, uh, his wife Margaret, and Dr. Gordon Laddo was uh, president at that time. Um, Jay Dinsha and a committee of people of local vegetarian societies in the United States. It was decided that if we were going to host a Congress, we should also start a national vegetarian society for North America. Because although there were groups, and some of them quite good across the states, they didn't know about each other and they didn't know what each other were doing. So the North American Vegetarian Society was founded in 1974 and a mass massive publicity effort began to tell people about the coming World Vegetarian Congress. In our house, we had a number of young people who came and stayed and uh, worked really for room and board and maybe a little bit of pocket money. Uh, these were the days before vegetarian convenience foods. Uh, we had to make our own uh, milk. I would make a gallon of sesame milk in a huge wearing blender every day. We made our own soy cheese to make pizza. And we were charged with the job of providing the recipes to be used at the Congress. The University of Maine wanted recipes that were batched out for 100 portions. And so this um, was, was a big effort. First of all, we 
asked other people to give us recipes and, and information, but not much was forthcoming. So within the space of a couple of months, we tested a lot of recipes, did a lot of measuring and, and math, and provided the recipes to the university. We were fortunate that they had a wonderful staff, very cooperative, at the University of Maine. They invited us up when they had tested the recipes so that we could tell them whether they had done it correctly and uh, what size portions um, people would want and so on and so forth. And lots of things sort of happen by happenstance. One of the times when we were up there going over the arrangements, uh, there was a tour going through and it was um, members of the farm in Tennessee, a vegan commune which was pretty new at that time. And uh, their leader, Stephen Gaskin, was giving a talk and then they had a rock band playing. And to us it was amazing to hear someone else delivering a vegan message at that time. Now the speakers who came to the Congress were a wonderful group. There was Henry Bailey Stevens, who was um, pretty elderly at that time. He was the author of a book called The Recovery of Culture, a professor, I think, uh, University of New Hampshire. And he had also written an epic poem called Paradesa, which was based partly on the recovery of culture. This poem was performed as a dance um, with music um, by the Paul Winter concert and the dancing by the Divine Light Dancers. Henry Bailey Stevens reminded us that the first war was when the herdsmen of Lot and Abraham contended with each other over grazing lands for their flocks and herds. The fall was when man left the garden culture and became a wandering herdsman. Another giant who was at the Congress was Richard St. Barb Baker. He was 85 years old at that time, known as a champion of the California redwood trees. He had founded the Men of Trees and written many books on silviculture uh, pertaining to trees in Africa, the Middle East, and elsewhere. Uh, Richard St. Barb Baker was a lifelong vegetarian. Uh, he was a, a vegan, ex with the exception of using honey from his own bees. He claimed that the Dust Bowl of the United States was caused largely by the stockyards of Chicago. He explained that the derivation of the word, the word field came from the word felled, as from when trees are felled to clear space for crops and grazing. And he told the Congress that if uh, meat is produced, it can take up to 18 times more land than when we, when we grow pulses, grains, and vegetables. He saw there was a desperate need to replant trees, uh, particularly to reclaim the Sahara Desert. And he, enga he engaged African tribes in tree planting with ceremonial song and dance. Richardson Barb Baker at that time said, there are 22 million soldiers being trained around the world to fight each other. Wouldn't it be better for them to fight their common enemy, the Sahara and other deserts of the world? And this is a very good suggestion. I've heard it again from Dr. Clapper and other people since. Richardson Barbaker was one of the people 
who inspired the first woman Nobel Peace Prize winner, Wangari Mathai, who won the Peace Prize for her environmental activism. Wangari Mathai, who died I think a year or two ago, taught the women of Kenya to plant trees to lift themselves out of poverty so that they would have wood for fuel and she taught them to grow sustainable native crops so that they would not be hungry. In 1975, US Vegetarian Society leaders were Neil Emke of the New York Vegetarian Society, Ruben Abramowitz, Los Angeles Vegetarian Society, and Dixie May, San Francisco Vegetarian Society. <laughs> Leonard Lasky, Long Island Vegetarian Society. Madge Darnell, DC Vegetarian Society. And, and uh, Bob Zuro, the Vegetarian Society of Detroit. Dixie may be modest, she, she played a big role at the Congress. She acted as a chairperson for some of the sessions. She gave a cooking demo, and of course, she danced. And I danced here today. We saw you. Ah, so did you miss it? I'm going to dance tomorrow, too. After the time is after that. So let me tell you about a few more of the giants who were there. Scott Nearing was 91 years old at the time. Uh, he and Helen had um, become homesteaders and taught natural gardening and social reform. They were forced into the homesteading life because Scott lost his job at the University of Pennsylvania for being outspoken about uh, child labor. Also at the Congress was Dr. Ralph Berker of the Nature Cure Clinic in Switzerland. Perhaps you're familiar with Muesli. That, uh, I think, originated with his Nature Cure Center. Anne Wigmore came to Orono, Maine. She was the pioneer of raw food, sprouting, wheatgrass juice, and a common sense philosophy. Sherry Soria became a friend of hers, and we can thank uh, Sherry for the wonderful meal she gave us this evening. Uh, she took the raw food principles and raised them to new heights of gourmet eating, as you saw. The tennis pro Peter... The tennis pro Peter Burwash came to Orono and showed us how fit he was. I think he was the fittest athlete in Canada at the time, and he gave a demonstration of um, tennis and taught us how to play ten tennis as average people, but uh, he gave a wonderful demonstration. RJ Cheatham um, was there talking about natural hygiene, and... Um, did you have something to say, Tom? No. No? I'm applauding what you're saying. Oh, okay. I knew RJ pretty well. Yes. Yeah, yeah he had a um, health resort in Florida at Bonita Springs. And um, he was a, a good businessman and, and promoter. There were some wonderful activists there. Um, from Ohio was Nellie Shriver who taught a lot of us about the value of, using, uh, of making press releases and getting the word out. Alex Hershaft was at, in Orono, and uh, he probably has different stories to tell from mine, but uh, at an event like this, so much goes on, you can't know all about it. But I know to Alex, the value of the Congress 
was the networking um, that people did and the ideas that were spawned there. Uh, Tom Reagan, at that time I think an assistant professor of philosophy, um, was at Maine and it was inspirational to him. He was later to write the book, The Case for Animal Rights. Uh, he was something of a rival in matters of thought with Peter Singer. Um, Peter Singer was not at the Congress, as far as I know, but that was the year he wrote the book Animal Liberation, which was the foundation of the modern animal rights movement. Dr. Ethel Thurston, a professor of music, attended. Uh, she had a branch of the Beauty Without Cruelty organization in New York. And she, with uh, Marsha Pearson, would put on some wonderful fashion shows uh, over the years, um, promoting clothing without using any animals, no fur, no wool, no leather, and so on. Uh, they did wonderful work. Of the Seventh-day Adventist, Stoy Proctor, Director of Health Services, of the Illinois um, Convention of Seventh-day Adventists was a speaker. Paul Obis, editor of Vegetarian Times, which was then, I think, a four-sheet paper, was at the University of Maine, and he went on to make that a, a big magazine, even though he's now, no, now lo, no longer with it. And another person who attended was Victoria Musi, who is now Victoria Musi Moran, who has written some wonderful books um, on veganism, the first one being Compassion, the Ultimate Ethic, and also um, popular books such as Creating a Charmed Life. Her latest book is Main Street Vegan, and she has um, created an academy of... Um, for people to come and study. She calls it Main Street Vegan Academy. And she is training people there to become leaders and teachers of veganism. So that um, is a wonderful project that she has. The classes take part in New York City and the American Vegan Society is pleased to offer some support to what she's doing there. Uh, J. Milton Hoffman, who had been to Hunza and written a book about it, attended. From Australia came Dr. David Phillips, who was importing books and um, distributing natural foods and doing natural farming and gardening and teaching about it. From Latin America came Dr. Manuel J. Londoño of the American... American Federation of Naturists, Latin American Federation of Naturists. He had had some remarkable success working with polio patients um, and using natural vegetarian methods. Uh, from Sweden, I believe it was, came Carlo Otto Alley of the Nature Cure Sanitarium. And another person from Australia was Madge Coburn, president of the Hopewood Health Centre. She and uh, a gen gentleman from Australia, I'm not certain of his name, so I don't want to say the wrong name at the moment, but um, they had raised World War II orphans, uh, I think over 80 of them, on a natural food vegetarian diet, very successfully. Uh, they had um, virtually no tooth decay, which was remarkable. From England, Serena Coles came and presented a message from the Vegan Society. Isabel James, who had a guest house in the Lake District, uh, was in attendance. Her food had been photographed by Jeffrey Rudd. Jack Lucas was um, with the IVU Scientific Committee, and he had a book with land use charts, and one of the early people to talk about land use. And then there was uh, Dr. Gordon Latto, quite a col colorful character. Uh, he was 
a nature cure doctor, and an avid golfer. And one of the things he was known for was asking his patients to come for very early appointments, such as four in the morning. And one of his patients was uh, Sir Francis Chichester, who had sailed alone around the world. Uh, they had to come for these early appointments so Dr. Latto could get out and play golf. Uh, from India, the uh, Satguru of the Namdari Sikhs attended, and he was, on, he was not allowed or didn't permit himself to drink water that came through pipes. And so we had to find a natural spring to get water for him. And uh, the staff at the University of Maine said, we've come up with a spring, we can provide water for the Sat Guru. Rukmini Devi Arundel came from India and she was lamenting how the Indian vegetarian tradition was being lost through the influence of Western culture and encouraging Western vegetarians to go to India to help stem that tide. Jayan Manka attended and the Manka Trophy was named after him. He had hosted the World Vegetarian Congress in India in 1957, 1967 and was working on it in 1977. Uh, Surendra Mehta was another giant from India. Um, he became a leader in IVU and uh, he was quite a genius at fundraising. He went around to a lot of businessmen and uh, said that we need money and he got it. Uh, teaching yoga classes and other health classes was Dr. Mehrwan Bamgara, also uh, a nature cure doctor. Uh, he would later, with Jashu Shah, do a lot to promote um, vegetarianism throughout Asia, and the Indian government um, funded his travel to promote um, coming Asian Vegetarian Congress. I expect I'm going over time, am I? How are we on time? Hmm? Yes. Can you, you want me to wrap minutes. it up? Five minutes? Okay. Uh, so as a result of that um, conference, many more vegetarian groups um, arose, um, over 65 new groups in a, in a short span of time. And since then, we've gone through the 1980s um, when vegetarian foods um, became much more readily available. Um, to the general public, um, soy milk, tofu, and so on, um, into health food stores and then into um, supermarkets. Uh, there's been an explosion of books, and uh, that's remarkable. Um, many notable groups, uh, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Neil Barnard, doing wonderful work and uh, the Vegetarian Resource Group in Baltimore, Maryland, and the Animal Rights Movement in general. Uh, the 1990s brought the internet, uh, vegetarian food festivals. I think Toronto was the first one to do their festival in the harbor, and they've inspired such events, uh, not only here in San Francisco, but um, in, in Boston, in Florida, and. Um, in Virginia and many other places. Um, vegan Thanksgiving celebrations uh, throughout the years have been uh, a great activity. So we see a lot of success, but we also face a big challenge because although it seems there are more vegetarians, there is also a lot of bad health and um, environmental destruction that we currently face. Um, the rates of obesity and the accompanying health issues in the United States are, have mounted and are very serious. And I think it's important that we go out into the general community 
and encourage people to improve their diets. We can go along with some of the messages from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, their goal is to increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables and protein from um, vegetable sources amongst the public. Uh, the public has turned much too much to meat and dairy products, and we're in a position to help them change. We don't have to make them do a complete change. Maybe they'll decide on that themselves from our example. But um, we can make it easier for them. Family meals are almost a thing of the past quite widely. And I'm told about um, families where there are single parents and um, parent, parent works and has to hurry home um, just to get the child um, bathed and, and, and to bed. Uh, they have breakfast at McDonald's, they have school lunch, and then they have uh, supper at McDonald's. So you see they're not getting the fruits and vegetables and healthy um, things they need. I think it's important that we make our activities very attractive to people because they have other things that are um, much easier for them to do, sit at home and watch TV. Other diversions which keep their minds off um, the problems that we should be confronting. And we'll be talking more about that in our forum tomorrow. So with that, I shall close. Thank you. I really appreciate the, the fact that she and Jay put on that Congress because, as you can see, they spawned a lot of people to go out throughout the country and start their own vegetarian societies.